Hi, so uh, today we are going to talk about building a cross-cloud data protection engine. Um, my name is Richard Conway, and just to give you a little bit about me, um, I'm a Microsoft Azure Most Valuable Professional and have been for the last eight years. Uh, and I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director, so I regularly liaise with the product teams, um, especially over data platform, which is, uh, which is most, of, uh, you know, most of the things that I do from day to day. Um, I'm a very strong community advocate and uh, founder of the UK Azure User Group um, and also uh, Data Science London. Um, I'm very, very passionate about big data. Um, started uh, my big data journey um, in the Hadoop revolution and uh, I like speaking about this um, a lot. Um, so I'll now hand over and introduce you to Sandy um, who's going to be co-speaking today. Thanks for that introduction, Richard. So as Richard has mentioned, we're going to talk about a cross-cloud data protection engine. And who am I? Well, I'm Sandy May. I am a Databricks champion. And like Richard, I'm one of the co-organizers of Data Science London. Again, similar to Richard, Data Platform is a big passion of mine, specifically Spark and even more so uh, Databricks is part of that as well. So. Today, we're gonna to go through um, the end-to-end -end of how we can build a data protection engine, so. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about our agenda today. Um, so I'm gonna start off by talking about what a data protection engineer is and why we need it. Um, you may not know the terminology, but guaranteed that um, in your day-to-day, -day, um, you've had your companies, consultancies, um, any number of um, customers potentially talking about how they protect their data on the cloud. It's a concern to everybody. Um, and then I'm going to be handing over to Sandy, who's going to show you how to build a data protection engine with the idea in mind of the real power of Databricks in that it can operate um, on both Microsoft Azure and AWS. So taking patterns and practices where we could build, build it once and run it anywhere. Okay, so to give a data protection engine overview. So if we break down the problem, um, the, there are many motivations for companies now um, as, to, as to how and why they should protect their data. Um, there's a framework such as GDPR, um, which, is, um, which is a European framework that, uh, that we adhere to which is a standard for protecting uh, private, private and personal information, and CCPA as well. Um, fines can be in the billions of dollars now, so companies are taking this very, very seriously because it's very, very important that, uh, that data is protected, private data is not available in the clear specifically, and that it's, uh, it's both traceable and auditable so that uh, you know, in the event that, uh, that, that there's some kind of breach, all of the protections have been put in place. Um, there's examples of where this has become an issue. Um, for example, a British Airways fine of 204 million euros, um, which is a huge sum of money from July 2019, um, with half a million customers that were affected. Um, and, you know, based on all of the revenues, the earnings of uh, companies, um, the highest theoretical fine in this area, based on the uh, the maximum 4% value, is uh, $21 billion. So that's a lot of motivation for customers to, um, uh, companies to protect their customers' data. Um, you know, off-the-shelf products can be expensive, especially for smaller companies who have to have the same control mechanisms as, uh, as larger businesses that can afford license fees and um, pay per use, transactional fees and things like this. Um, and the thing is this, is, this is an area which is developing incredibly quickly. And so with new regulation um, coming out uh, monthly, um, it's really, really important to ensure that the, that the roadmaps that you have for your specific um, industry, um, industry regulations are adhered to, um, which is again, one of the other reasons why we took a customized approach to this. Um, and um, you know, a lot of this is driven by the fact that people are migrating data, they're doing very, very large big data workloads uh, in the cloud, um, which is 
which is why we're all here today, because um, Databricks is, uh, is a fantastic um, big data platform which does all of the work for you. And so uh, most companies now are using this, um, are using this as compute um, against their data lakes in, in Azure or AWS. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that, is that companies still own the risk of, um, of securing their data. Just because you have a product, it's not a silver bullet. So it's really, really important to understand how these products work, how it interacts with your data, so that you can ensure that your data is secure, because inevitably you're responsible for that. And you're also responsible for bugs in software um, that may not be your software. Um, and you know, one of the other things that, that's important to mention, uh, we talk about PII data, which is personal data. Um, some of these products don't actually detect this, um, you know, hence why we've uh, why we've decided to uh, to try to try and build a sample for ourselves. So this is the question, and uh, it's not just about this particular service that we're talking about, but you know, should we build this? Should we buy this? Um, and they're the same they're the same conversations that you have around um, all of the new technologies where uh, where vendors. Um, are coming some of them are, 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 are very good technologies but we feel that um, that because um, databricks is such a, a fantastic generalized platform for big data um, it cuts down the build time um, considerably if you were going to start from scratch and write your own software and of course it has cloud scale and elasticity so if we if we look at the uh, the reasons for building this um, you know owning the IP, um, you can build your own feature roadmaps and prioritize them. Um, you know, there's lots of specific um, asks of this. So you build for your primary use cases. Um, you know, no license fees. Um, you just pay for the core technology, for um, your stored data in a data lake, and for Databricks doing the underlying comp compute. And uh, you decide how you're going to inter interact with Databricks through your APIs and um, other mechanisms. Um, if you buy a, if you buy a new technology, you know it may have a proven track record. Um, vendors may fix bugs, but you know features features especially now don't have the cadence that businesses need them um, because delivery teams um, generally have a lot of customer asks. Um, but then at the same time, you do have service level agreements. So, so what are the what are the business needs? Um, the business needs all come down to um, uh, to integration. So, um, we we are very very used to pipelining data and scheduling data, maybe triggering against events. Um, but generally, we'll find that uh, data platforms exist, and if we're if we're trying to protect that data, we need to treat that. Um, as an attribute of the platform. So it needs to be able to, uh, to integrate well. Um, we also need to track the lineage of protected data. Um, so it's important to understand that we need to have a metadata store um, against all of the transformations that we're gonna have to put in place through Databricks. Um, you'll, hear, you'll hear a lot of um, terminology um, pseudonymization, anonymization, generalization. Um, these are all features of a data protection engine. They effectively allow you to anonymize data so that if you, if you open that data on your data lake, you will not be able to identify the, uh, the private data, the person that it's referring to, whether it's, um, whether it's a combination of um, uh, names and salaries and you know, any protected uh, personal data that a company holds, um, we would want to make sure with this solution that nobody can guess that individual. Um, so there's, there's, a number of, um, there's a number of capabilities that we'd have to build in to do that. And that may be that we would, um, we would remove certain information, um, we would generalize it. So we may create buckets, if you like, of, um, of different values. Um, which replace, um, you know, exact values, and you know we may provide tokens um, and what are called token vaults as well, and you know in our case um, with our set of requirements, 
um, that ability to take these tokens, which are replacing real values, and then migrate them to another solution. So it has to be portable. So if we look at our uh, key design decisions, um, one of the uh, one of the things that we had to adhere to was, um, you know, that support to run on premises and the cloud. Um, so Spark um, obviously is a fantastic choice because um, it's a uh, it's a big data product which we can hit the ground running with. Um, the ability to use um, native tools in Azure and AWS. Um, that consistency between token vaults and auditability, um, that single pattern of reporting and being able to drive this from a set of metadata. And you can see that, you know, our chosen platform here was to do this on Spark um, using um, Databricks, um, AWS and Azure, um, have our token vault um, being stored in Delta Lake and then our reporting platform built in Power BI. Thanks for that again, Richard. So if we just quickly look at the architecture for Azure, what we can see is that we have the kind of two different streams of, of inputs. We have the top side looking from, uh, from landing. So this is when data actually lands. We're going to send a notification uh, that's going to run on event grid. That's going to then come to a queue, which is a, um, an Azure queue, and then we'll run a function to actually call the protection. So it's all automated. As soon as data is dropping in a data lake, we're going to start processing it. And it's a really simple flow. The bottom side is, as Richard said, we need some form of lineage and metadata. So what we're going to do is we're going to expose a really, really simple API that just allows you to create a registration. And it's a description of what's actually going to be protected in your data. We'll see an example of that later. And that can be interrupted with however you want for your business, whether it's uh, some automated power app, like uh, one of the examples that we've done, or if it's something more manual, that's, that's totally fine. So after the function has been um, called to actually protect the data, the Databricks instance Spark is going to come out. It's going to grab a policy that's been stored previously from Data Lake so it can work out what it needs to do over the actual data input that it's got. And then it's going to process all of that and chuck it out into a protected area. And then from an AWS perspective, it's basically copy paste, right? So creating these two diagrams for me was really simple. Um, all I had to do was change the pictures. Um, the functionality is exactly the same. And that's what we're trying to bring that in one of our customer use cases, we have to target AWS and we have to target Azure. But we want to write things once for multiple clouds. So we're going to use the same kind of logic, um, have registrations that come again from a central power app, but it does call both. Uh, in case we have data processing in Azure, or we have data processing in AWS. But the flow and the lineage is exactly the same across both. And one of the last pieces that we need to think about from a key design perspective is config driven, right? So this is that registration that I was talking about. What we can do in that is that we can describe our source data and we can uh, describe where the location is, the file formats, authentication methods, whether that's IAM in S3 or whether that's a key or service principle in Azure, and also the destination output as well. So anything that the credentials are provided for, we should be able to have access to and write out to, whether that's DBFS like this, the Databricks file system, whether that's um, a Azure Data Lake, whether that's S3, or even the SQL Server, if we need it to be. And then on the right-hand side, we have more of a description about what we can actually do. So we have obfuscation methods, like Richard said, pseudo anonymization, anonymization, generalization. And we're trying to make it really, really generic. So you can list multiple columns that you want to protect in the same way. Um, so look at the second element, the anonymization. We have two columns we're protecting, employee number, employee field, both with the same value redacted. So we should just see that the anonymized, the whole column turned into redacted. And it's all nice and traceable throughout the whole flow as well. 
Okay, and now I'm going to switch over to um, talking a little bit through some of the code that we've got and uh, some of the demos that we've set up as well. So I'm just going to quickly talk through how we actually see this running um, in a production scenario. So we don't see it running through notebooks. We, uh, we use automation, as we kind of showed in the demo, in the slide, sorry. But what I want to do is just talk you through what actually happens, what's happening under the covers, and how you can get your hands on this if you want to as well. So I have a really simple Databricks notebook, which is just showing doing some imports of the actual functionality that we've built, which I'll go through in a little moment. Um, reading in some data for anyone who's interested. This is the IBM HR um, data set from Kaggle, a uh, personal favorite of mine for doing demonstrations. And it just describes um, attrition, right? So we're looking at factors that could lead to attrition within uh, staff members. So that's the key field. It's more of a machine learning data set, but it works for our use case. And like we said in our, in our policy description, we can describe where data is. In this instance, it's in the Databricks file system, it's in Parquet, and this is the actual raw data. So we obviously wouldn't want to read this in and display it in a production scenario because that's not going to be good, especially if it's PII data, just a demo. Um, but what we want to see is what it's actually doing when we run this, right? So we're going to pass it this JSON configuration. And what we should see is the columns uh, start to be protected. So business travel reason, we want to protect using pseudo anonymization. And pseudo anonymization is reversible. So there should be a token mapping created that we're able to consume and use later on as well. We're then going to fully anonymize the employee number and the education field using the value redacted anonymization. We're then going to create a generalization, which, as Richard said, is about putting things into buckets. So we're going to do that on the daily rate, which is just uh, a field. Uh, I think it's explaining salary. And we should see that put into bucket intervals of um, kind of 50, because that's what we specified as a split. So this is just going to call out to the main method. So we're just loading this just to pure JSON, um, pure string. We're going to call out to that main method. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to load back in the actual protected data that we've just written back out. And we'll have a look at some, some of the results and how we can see what's actually happened from joins and tokens and continuality kind of views as well. So we can see, as we've described in that policy, we have a crazy looking string for business travel. We'll explain how this is created in a little bit. We have a daily rate, which has gone from um, being just a, a numeric to something that's in a range. And again, you can kind of manipulate this for your use case. If you wanted it as a pure number that was the lower end of the bucket or the higher end of the bucket, or you wanted array values rather than just a pure string here, you can see that daily rate has now become a string instead of an integer. You can do that. It's relatively easy to change all of this with the code that will open source for you. And education field, employee number, fully redacted, none of that anywhere in the data set. So that's exactly what we want. We should be able to see, here's a good example, um, some differences in the business travel because there are multiple occurrences. Uh, sorry, there's multiple business travel reasons. There's not just one. So if I just quickly run through these uh, last cells, I've created a just a little dashboard that should explain, but doesn't look as nice as it was supposed to. OK, we'll look here instead. So what we're doing is we're just looking at the amount of business travel. So we're doing a group by, we're doing a count. So you can see there's three different types, non-travel, travel frequently, and travel rarely, with 150, 277, and 1,043 occurrences. And what we want to see to prove that this has worked is that those same numbers are consistent when we tokenize. So what do we create with a token? We create a key and a token for reversibility. What you'll notice is this is not actually the same value as we store in the, in the actual field. What this is is a salt. So we're encrypting the value to protect it but we're salting it first. So the actual protection is the token plus the key followed by an MD5 hash. So that's how we're creating it. So even if somebody had access to a token vault, 
they wouldn't actually be able to reverse this straight away. They would also have to understand the encryption algorithm. Then you can start to do things like maybe using SHA2 and adding, um, adding a seed that's specific in a secrets manager or a key vault as well. So that's the kind of thing that we can, that we can show. Um, and we can see that this is the actual encryption that we create off the back of it. And I'm missing one cell. If I quickly add this in using the de-identified, what we should see is the same numbers coming back out for us. So we've got that 150, 277, and 1043 from the mapping, which is exactly what we want. It's showing that we're having consistency across our tokens, and we can still use that data, and we can still reverse that data back to the original key, should we need to, for any specific business use cases that we may have for that. So as I said, we're going to open source this code. Um, we try to keep it as simple as possible. What we really, really want to show is that you can build this yourself, maybe to start with, right? You don't have to pay half a million dollars, pounds for a product and then build your service around it. You can use this, which, which will be on GitHub, and you can then build your service and then go, actually, we do need a product because we need this feature, this feature, this feature, but you've already built your service around it. So you're ready to go. This is just an API that it's exposing via Databricks. So our main is really simple. We load a configuration, we load data, and then we run an obfuscation. And an obfuscation is just based on that input policy. So we're loading it into something that we can use in Scala. Um, as I said, obfuscation is, is really simple. It's just calling out to um, a list of functions, whether that is a replacement, a generalization, or a pseudo anonymization. All this is doing is, is a fold over data. So it's just going through that list of policies one by one and applying functions over the top. Anonymization, really simple, right? All we're doing is a with column with a literal value. That's all you need to do, right? Just get rid of the column, keep the column name, replace it with a value. You could even add a function here, which is drop column, and you just remove the column completely from your data set if you need to. Generalization, again, don't overcomplicate it. Use the things that Spark already has. ML Bucketizer, exactly what we need. It's going to take all of those values. It's going to find the specific buckets based on a split, and then it will tell us what bucket our individual field sits within. And again, if you want to change the way that it looks how I was saying that we had um, the value dash another value. You can just change this function here to pass in an individual number, right? You can take the lower bound, um, which is this, or you could take the next upper bound, or you can do whatever you want within there as well. But it's all baked in and it's all there for you to use. Pseudo anonymization, slightly more complicated. We haven't done the, uh, the reversibility, but you can build that yourself as well. And all we're doing is finding out from our token store what's new. What haven't we seen before? If we've already seen it before, we can protect it. We have the salt for that. We can protect that value. If not, create new salts, just a random uh, 10 digit, I think. Yeah, 10 characters. Create that salt and then apply it with MD5 hashing. And that's all that we've kind of built. But it's the standard practice that you need to apply from a from a PII perspective. One of the key things to think about is right to erasure, though, and thinking I need to create a way to actually apply right to erasure and remove tokens from dictionaries as well. So we can't reverse that back together. But as I said, this will come into uh, GitHub. We'll leave a link in um, slides, hopefully. We can update them after. Um, and it's free for anybody to look at and use. And then if we just sum up what we've seen and what we've done so far. So for us, some future works will be looking at machine learning PII detection. So we've done some proof of concepts of 
just using regex patterns, right? So a lot of the things that you need to look at, you can get from regex. So zip codes, um, postcodes, social security numbers, national insurance numbers, a lot of that you can define in regex, but things like names uh, are really hard to do. So we'll have a look at some, some ML to see if we can create something there. K anonymity is a is a really cool concept. Um, it allows anonymity in in groups. So essentially, you can still identify people with um, what their postcode, their gender, and their name. I think there was a, a report that you can identify something like ninety percent of Americans with just those three factors. None of them are actually PII by themselves. But when you combine them, you identify people. So what K-anonymity does is it's an algorithm that allows you to say, oh, there shouldn't be more than, or there should be at least five people in any combination of identifiers. So you could say in gender, postcode, and um, zip. No, uh, in, in three identifiers, you can only, you must have at least five people. If you have less than five, then it will trim the buckets. It'll make them smaller. It'll take two digits off the postcode. It'll increase the generalization of the age range, something like that. Um, a batching service. So at the minute, we just run one job at a time, um, but we just want to kind of batch things together, make it more efficient from a Spark point of view and manage um, the Delta Lake in a, in a better way. And then decentralizing the solution is a really cool idea that Essentially, instead of having like one central data protection system across your maybe enterprise business where you could have uh, 10 different customers using the same token rule and sharing a dictionary, you instead decentralize that and you make all of the data set owners, the owners of the keys as well, and they can deal with the actual mappings and the joinings between those as well. And then just to kind of wrap up at the end, so where we see this sitting is, is something to just accelerate teams. So we aren't trying to replace all of the products that exist out there that have many, many more features than we will probably ever create from an open source project. What we're really trying to do is to say that for small businesses that maybe can't afford that, here's something that could get you going. We all know that Spark can be as cheap as we need it to be if we've got small data and it's still efficient on big data as well. And then for bigger teams that are saying, right, we need a central solution and we're going to pay half a million, a million dollars, pounds for company X's product, but we're going to spend nine months creating a service around that. You don't have to do that. Just use this, create a service, then integrate. It's going to take that time from nine months down to maybe one or two. And I guess the key takeaway is there's no false promises when you build it yourself as well. You know what you've done. Yes, it's open source, but it's just a starting point, right? There's going to be so much that you could do with your development team that will get you going. And you know exactly what you've covered and what your risks are, unlike a maybe black box product as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully we've got some Q and A and some questions come through and we can answer that in the chat. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to say thank you for attending. And um, I know that the Spark Summit guys want us to um, get you guys to give some feedback to the sessions as well. So please um, give us feedback. You can contact me or Richard on our Twitter handles, which are at the bottom of all the slides on Spark Spartan and Richard is Azure Coder. So thank you.